This week on Life and Faith. We all come to moments where it's like, I can't go on. (laughs) But the reality is that you are doing it and it might be hard, but you are the mother to that child and you are caring for them and bringing them life. If we only knew the things that would make for peace. It retains many of its values. It's just taken death, judgment, heaven and hell out of the picture. I'm here to make killers out of people and you're here to make them feel good about it. What happened to the other 97%? Welcome to Life and Faith from CPX. I'm Simon Smart. I'm Justine Toe. And I'm Natasha Moore, and if you're listening to this episode on the day it's released, then you can wish Simon a happy birthday. Uh, What number are you up to here, Simon? (laughs) Well, actually, it depends how you count. Mm, It's complicated for you. It is. Yeah, and this year is a leap year, which means Simon, who was born on the 29th of February, actually gets a birthday this year. Do you celebrate extra more than normal, Simon? No, absolutely, I do. One every four years, you've got to make the most of it. I get a birthday every Summer Olympics. Oh, wow. Possibly like the Olympics. They're starting to lose their sheen. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, little kids love this. Like if you explain to a little kid that I get a birthday every four years, their eyes are sort of, they're in wide-eyed amazement and <laughs> slight horror and sort of look sympathetic. So, yes, when I get one, you've got to. Go hard. Yeah, go for it. (laughs) Well, as this is a once in four years event, we thought it would be worth marking the occasion with an episode of Life and Faith on birthdays, or because that was a bit of a hard topic to find that much to say about, on birthdays. Yes, note the pause. Um, Of course, because you're also due to be heading off on maternity leave soon, Natasha. So Mm. your birthday is coming. (laughs) Someone's. (laughs) It's coming up. So, yeah, it occurred to us. We have quite a few episodes over the years which tell particular people's stories of birth. Uh, We also have things on life and death and infertility and disability. It's often a bit harrowing, but we've had some beautiful stories over the years but we've never done an episode on birth itself this felt like the right time to do it we're going to talk about what's good about it what's hard about it what makes it such a significant experience yeah I remember having a conversation um, with a good friend years ago maybe 15 years ago um, and she was pregnant she'd had like a hard road she'd had a couple of miscarriages first before this pregnancy and she was kind of telling me how there's a bit of a conspiracy of silence on Mm -hmm. these things. I wondered if the conspiracy of silence thing has changed quite a bit since we had that conversation, that there's a lot more said now and a lot more openly about that experience of pregnancy and birth and early parenthood. Lots of mummy books around, but more public than that as well. On my father's day, he would walk up to the hospital entrance and the nurse would take the suitcase and say, that will be all. And he'd be sent off and you'd get a phone call. He wasn't allowed anywhere near it. Get a phone call. <laughs> yep. Not wow. just, you know, was he, didn't, you know, did he want to be there or not? There was no way you were allowed in there. There's no option. That's changed. Yeah. Women's business. Changed a lot. Yeah. It really does feel like secret women's business. Um, I think that when I had a child for the first time, that was about 10 years ago, I still think that around that time, you had to go through that experience of birth and suddenly you were inducted into a secret society where everyone talked about how difficult it was, not just birth, but having children. And, you know, when people would say things like, doesn't it feel like a quote unquote war zone downstairs? And, Mm. you know, for someone like me who'd never been in hospital before and who'd watched a movie like, for example, Nine Months. I mean, this is also an incredibly old movie, but it's got Hugh Grant and Julianne Moore. And it's about this couple going through the process of having a child. And her birthing scene, I'm not kidding, looked like it lasted about 10 seconds. Mm. And then out pops this baby, right? So the conspiracy of silence, I think, is real. And none of us really wants to lean into the difficulty of it. But I do think that certainly women are speaking more amongst themselves and others as well about the huge range of their birth experiences. And, you know, it's actually becoming quite public. Um, There's been lots in the media over the last six months or so about this inquiry here in New South Wales into birth trauma, 
which apparently something like one in three women are experiencing, and this might involve either a traumatic physical injury or the psychological toll of how things have gone very differently to how they wanted or expected. And I probably put myself in that latter category. (laughs) Some of this silence is, I suppose, stems from people not wanting to colour people's experience or or load them up with anxiety and you know for what's coming so yeah because it almost feels like the opposite to me now I mean I know I'm in both the situation of at a time when this inquiry has come out and the algorithm knows that I'm pregnant so it's feeding me a lot of this content (laughs) which has been super helpful to have regularly in an emotional state on (laughs) social media um but I do feel like particularly the negatives are talked about a lot now you you haven't been protected from all that but are there things natasha you're deliberately reading you're a book person presumably you've picked up a few books in this part of your life surely yeah people have lent me a lot of books which i am grateful for i have been you know dipping into various ones some of them i kind of dip into and then i want to throw across the room (laughs) for various reasons do tell why why do you throw Um, those ones across the room Some because I find them a bit weird. Some of it is like, you know, okay, if you want to draw a sacred circle around yourself and that's your thing, then cool, not my thing. (laughs) Um, Others because they're quite guilt-inducing. Like they're very like you have to do this and this and not do this or, you know, your baby will suffer. And some of that I have the advantage of um, my husband is a neonatologist. He looks after newborn babies. So when I say to him, okay, this book says this, and he says, well, that's medically incorrect. I can be like, okay, I throw it across the room. That helps. I feel good about yeah. that. But there have been some good ones though? Yes, there have been some that I've really enjoyed. Um, I've been dipping into the classic, what to expect when you're expecting. And that has been very reliable. You think it would be after years and years of use. I'm currently reading a book called Baby Brain by an Australian Dr. Sarah Mackay about um, how your brain changes during Mm. pregnancy and early parenthood. I read, maybe this is an unconventional read for this kind of thing, French children don't throw food. (laughs) Do you know that one? It's hilarious and it made me feel like much more positive about parenting. Like maybe this doesn't have to be a disaster and it can work out okay for everyone. But also one that actually I read before I was pregnant because I knew the author but then – read again now that it applies more directly to me and that one is called bringing forth life yes now this one is by jody mciver who's a midwife in sydney or blue mountains region and we've invited her onto the podcast today now what's its approach tasha so this book it is a very digestible overview of kind of the journey of having a baby so it's both from the perspective of a midwife. There's lots of practical stuff in there about hormones and healthcare and labor and so on, but also specifically from a faith perspective. So the subtitle is God's Purposes in Pregnancy and Birth. That being said, I think it's accessible and interesting for everyone, whether you're a believer or not. This book really helps you to mull over where what is a pretty intense process fits within the larger story of your life and your identity and maybe even within the story of the universe. No pressure, right? (laughs) (laughs) Well, later on, Natasha, Simon and I each have a birthday story or piece of advice to share with you ahead of your due date. But first, let's go to your conversation with Jodie McIver. Tell me, how did you become a midwife? This interest started early for you, right? (laughs) depends how far you want to go back but I guess it was a forced interest Uh, as a young child I did watch uh, my mother give birth to my brother and my sister when I was three and six years old but I wouldn't say my interest necessarily developed along from there it wasn't till after I'd finished school and I actually started a psychology degree that I rethought and decided I wanted to do something that would lead into a people-focused vocation very quickly. And I thought about doing nursing more generally and midwifery. And it was really just my wonder and marvel at the female body and its amazing functioning in growing and giving birth to a baby that made me go, no, that's really where I'm interested. Let's go there. 
Tell me what's special about what you do. Like what do you love about being part of this particular moment of people's lives? As a midwife, I think in a way we're just spectators, but it's still such a privilege to share with families in such a significant moment in their lives. And not just by moment, I mean like the months and weeks following and that whole kind of experience of transition from just being adults if they're having their first baby to suddenly becoming a family and just seeing the amazing power of the female body and the amazing things it can do and to hopefully offer them some guidance and support along the way. This doesn't get mundane for you. Like I kind of, when I went for a scan and saw my baby's heartbeat for the first time and we were like, wow. And, but the technician and the obstetrician in the room were also like, wow, look, this is amazing. And I was like, but you see this every day. And they were like, but it's always amazing. Is it always amazing? Yeah. That's great. I think sometimes we have to like be conscious ourselves not to become blasé about what an amazing thing is going on and definitely to share in that for the families. Certainly in a busy shift or, you know, you can all seem just like you've got to get on to the next thing. And But trying to retain a consciousness of the wonder is good for everyone. It's kind of strange that birth is such an everyday universal experience. Everyone is born but at the same time, so intense and so meaningful. Can you speak to people's sense of birth as a spiritual event, even if they might not think of themselves as particularly spiritual people in general? Yeah, I mean, I think it's something that people only do usually a few times in their lives at most. So it can be a kind of surreal experience, I think, for women especially, but for men as well. I guess a bit like death in a sense. This is a gateway between um, life and whatever lies beyond. So there can be a sense of being near to some sort of power of creation or of God in that moment. I often find families, even who have no particular faith background, will use words like miracle and miraculous when they have their baby against their chest the first time and they can't believe the miracle of the birth process itself, that this thing was all tucked inside there only moments ago, or just the amazing work of this little person coming into being inside them with every little finger and toe and a whole unique personality to come. In your experience, is that an enduring shift for people or more just at the time that this happens? Yeah, I mean, there's a whole lot of qualitative kind of research out there about birth and people experiencing it as spiritually transforming and very meaningful, whatever their kind of faith background is. So I think not for everyone, but certainly for some women, it does have ongoing implications and sort of reconfigures their mindset as they look out to the world now, almost with two sets of eyes and that kind of real change of mode of being from this one within you to now without of you but you're also sort of pretty interconnected still yeah and it can be really meaningful for people in different ways so if we go back a step to pregnancy which some people absolutely love and some people do not (laughs) enjoy their experience of it as a midwife and as a mum yourself what do you think is so hard and also so amazing about pregnancy Yeah, pregnancy is hard. There's the physical stuff. I know you were talking about back pain and all that. For me, the the hardest thing was just that nausea for weeks and months on end and just feeling like not yourself anymore and you can't do anything. But that's just the physical side, isn't it? I think something that's hard for many women is the loss of control that we experience through this transition. So For my friend Emily, that was sort of physical for her. She'd kept very fit and she was a runner and she'd sort of maintained control over her body. And then suddenly in pregnancy, it was changing all the time and she couldn't quite do what she used to do. And that was really hard, that loss of control. But even perhaps bigger, I think often people find the loss of control over the health of their baby. Like there's this baby they're responsible for and yet they don't know what's going on in those early weeks before they feel the movements. They don't know if their baby's okay. There's not much they can do to keep their baby safe. So that can be a real challenge for many men and women, I think. And also 
a loss of control over your own identity. I think this was a big one for me in terms of that idea of becoming a mother had never particularly appealed to me and it, you kind of feel like you're suddenly becoming pigeonholed in some way or you're, you're losing all the different parts of who you are into this one very bland pastel coloured um, <laughs> identity and so that can be hard too even though I'm not saying that's the full reality of what happened. <laughs> sure. It's interesting what you say about uncertainty and the risks involved in pregnancy and birth. But tell me specifically about your decision and I guess your husband's decision to not have genetic testing during your pregnancy. What was that about and what difference did it make to your experience? I think the whole question of testing in pregnancy generally can be such a minefield for people, often because they have no idea what's being tested or what the implications could be of the testing or what possible things they're going to find out or not find out. When I had my first baby, it, you know, things have actually come along quite a lot since then. We have extra tests and for better and worse. When I had my first baby, the options for genetic screening early in pregnancy is a nuchal translucency ultrasound and combined with blood tests. And that is a screening test, which gives you an idea of the risk of your baby having a few chromosomal abnormalities. But the result that you get is a number, which might be one in 200, a high risk result, or one in 5,000, a low risk result or one in 50, an even higher risk result, but still it's kind of not super high as well. So anyway, as a midwife, I was aware of this. And for me and my husband, we had decided we wouldn't terminate a pregnancy based on a chromosomal abnormality. And so for me, it was actually a, a fairly simple decision because I knew that it wouldn't change my actions during the pregnancy. And I also knew what big consequences these kind of testing can have for women who receive a high risk result, but then are faced with the decision of, well, do I just worry now for the next six months or do I undertake further diagnostic testing, which carries its own risks for the baby, perhaps of a similar numerical value to the, the risk of the baby having an abnormality. So these things can really change the experience of pregnancy. So I think it's worth people understanding what they're going into and having an idea of what they want out of this testing before they make those decisions. Now we do have a more accurate screening test, the non-invasive prenatal testing, which is a blood test. So that gives you a much more accurate, though still not definite result of what conditions your baby might have. But again, all these things, they're testing for a few chromosomal abnormalities, but there's no guarantees. Um, no matter how much testing you do, you can never be 100% certain of the health or of the particular condition of your baby or in their ongoing life after that. So I think pregnancy is an experience of learning to accept risk and you may make dis different decisions based on that. And, you know, wanting to know things is absolutely valid. But we do have to acknowledge that we're, we're never going to be fully in control of this. And it's not easy to have that uncertainty. I'll just share the story of my friend, Sam. She was 35 when she became pregnant. And of course, alarm bells suddenly, you know, you're suddenly of advanced maternal age. And she'd also recently experienced a miscarriage. And so she went into her pregnancy very keen for every test she could have to have that reassurance she hoped that her baby was okay. But sadly, testing doesn't always bring reassurance and she had a high-risk nuchal translucency and the stress of that. But then she did the non-invasive pregnancy testing and got a low-risk result, so that was reassuring. And then she had her mid-pregnancy ultrasound, which all seemed good. Baby was just a bit small. And then there was another ultrasound and then they thought, baby isn't growing as much as we would like and we want to test for infection in the baby and she had an amniocentesis which was normal but then she was told that the infection could have happened more recently and so maybe she should have another amniocentesis to check if baby possibly could have this infection at, at which point she had just had a horribly traumatic pregnancy. I think this is about the time I met her for pizza for dinner 
and she ended up declining the second amniocentesis and her baby was healthy, just slightly below average size. But just being conscious of how much these things can change your experience of pregnancy, which may be justified if you would make different decisions based on that. But if not, it's a lot that perhaps she didn't expect going into it. And you do acknowledge in your book that pregnancy can throw up what are crushingly difficult decisions for people. What advice do you give to women as they face some of those scenarios? As health professionals, we throw a lot of decisions at people and often women and families feel like they're not equipped to answer them. And and so there is that interesting question of responsibility there. But the reality is there are always risks both ways. And so even if you're presented a decision as this way will have risks, this way, you know, will resolve those risks. It's always worth asking and being conscious of the risks that come with the intervention to prevent the other risks because the health professional that you deal with may have a very different worldview, um, moral framework, ideology to you. And so you want to make sure that you're making um, the decision that's right for you. And no one is infallible with all this predictive advice either. So I think weighing up the risks and getting second opinions and being conscious that this is your decision to make and you need to feel comfortable with that afterwards, you and your partner, if you're becoming parents together. And I guess just not being afraid of hard necessarily. Things can be hard and it doesn't necessarily make that a bad choice. You're listening to Life and Faith and Jodie McIver is sharing her experience as a midwife as well as a mum for navigating the process of pregnancy and birth. What are some things that you wish people knew about labour and about kind of those early days of first parenthood? I often want to point out to people that their experience and the support they receive will be very different depending on the different choices that they make for care. And so I think that can be really important to consider when you become pregnant. But I guess bigger than that is that both pregnancy, birth and new parenthood, they're absolutely whirlwind experiences. And we all come to moments where... It's like, I can't go on. So if you look at the experience of labor, it's described as a moment of transition. When a woman is close to the time where she will begin to push this baby out into the world. And it's a time when um, there's a whole lot of hormonal stuff going on. But from an emotional perspective, people are often like, get me out of here. Take this baby out. I'm going home. You know, there's that kind of absolute... I'm done, I can't do this anymore, which feels like the lowest of the low points. But actually, you're on that pinnacle close to the end and you're about to give birth to your baby. And I think this can be similar in doing that round-the-clock care of a newborn. Um, And we can all come to points where it's like, I can't do this anymore. But the reality is that you are doing it. You're literally doing it. And it might be hard, but you are the mother to that child and you are caring for them and bringing them life. Um, Another handy hint that I always (laughs) give to new mothers, if they're breastfeeding, if in doubt, whip them out. (laughs) (laughs) Putting baby to the breast will solve every problem at every time often. (laughs) A handy multi-tool. Yeah. Okay. This is the practical advice that I need. A term that is increasingly used in this context is matrescence the process of becoming a mum and all the changes that that involves. It's a term that's meant to acknowledge how dramatic a biological and social shift is taking place here. Yeah, so the word matrescence was coined in the 1970s by Dana Raphael, but I think it's really only come into popular parlance more recently. Basically, it is like adolescence in that it's a big transition. It's a changing period, not only of your stage of life, but of your body, of your brain, of your hormones, of your role, of your identity, all these things are suddenly changing. So in matrescence, there are things that we are, in a sense, losing. 
and there are new things that we're gaining and it's okay to be sad about the things that we're losing. It's okay to have mixed feelings about this big transition and that's normal, I would say, but also see that there might be good things come out of those exact hard things as we're stretched and we grow and we change as our bodies are stretched, but we're stretched in much bigger ways as we adopt a new identity and learn what it is to care for a baby at great, great cost to ourselves. Because you talk a lot about that, you know, labour and birth are really good things, but also there's a lot of pain and heartbreak and uncertainty involved. I'm wondering, how do you reconcile those things for yourself and for other women? I did struggle with thinking about that almost seemingly disconnect between the hardness of pregnancy and birth, but also its goodness. And I think as I was writing my book and I was trying to kind of trying to deal with the the reality that sometimes really hard stuff happens, um, that was a real challenge. But what helped me make sense of it, and I think this may sound a bit cheesy, but as a Christian, looking at the work of God in the Bible, and I guess at the center of the Christian story is that of Jesus going through hardship and pain and ultimately dying in order to give life to his people or even as it's often described, to give them new birth through his death and resurrection. I think that helped me to think about how something can be absolutely horrible and horrendous and tragic, as in the case of this innocent man being tortured and killed, but in the very same moment being so good in a spiritual sense as this act of new birth and of bringing life to others. So I think that helped me think through how the goodness and the hardness of birth are not in fact separate aspects. It's not good in spite of its difficulty or difficult in spite of its goodness, but actually the goodness comes through the hardness. So I guess labor itself is kind of uniquely painful, but the pain is with a purpose and every contraction of the uterus is your body pushing and bringing your baby out into the world and to life. And so there is a reality that bringing forth life comes at a cost to us in a similar way that bringing forth life comes at a cost even to God. And that helps us then as we have different experience. And for some of us, there is real really hard or painful circumstances in pregnancy and birth that we acknowledge the awfulness of the loss or of the trauma and how horrendous that is. But given that bringing forth life does come at a cost, there's maybe some small reassurance there that you're still doing a wonderful thing, even though it's hard and painful you're bringing forth life or you're sharing with God as he brings forth life. And I think from a Christian perspective, that has eternal significance, that life goes beyond just our however many 80 years we have here or a short life of the baby that may be in our arms only for a short time. And so I think that can kind of help, perhaps not in the moment, but help people work through the various pain and suffering that does come with bringing forth life because pain isn't the end of the story. Something I learned from Jodie's book, Bringing Forth Life, is that the Bible actually has an awful lot of explicit references in it to pregnancy and birth. There are well over 200 mentions. For a book that's written a pretty long time ago and within strongly patriarchal cultures, there's a surprising lack of conspiracy of silence going on there. I asked Jodie a bit more about what the Bible actually says on the topic. It certainly doesn't shy away from the experience of women's bodies giving birth. You get those really detailed accounts where even, you know, one twin was born grasping the other's foot or, or all sorts of things. But ultimately, I think the Bible has birth in such a significant part of the story. Like from the beginning, you have these 
stories of women and couples who are infertile for various reasons who God gives a child to through birth and that child is part of this story of God working to care for and save his people in so many cases. I mean, I think I'd go so far as to say that the whole Bible is kind of a birth story because the Bible talks about God giving us new birth through Jesus being born to be God with us, but then dying and rising again to give us new birth. And that comes after this whole period of God bearing with his people and waiting this moment that's to come. And then after this new birth, we see this new little church or group of people who are kind of vulnerable and um, and there's that whole story where birth is really right at the center. And I think the fact that God chooses birth to help us understand deep realities, deep spiritual realities about his character and work in the world really gives honor to women's bodies and to these kind of human experiences as well as we kind of walk in Jesus' footsteps and share in the cost of bringing forth life in our own little way, a bigger picture offers a new perspective on these things. Do you have a favourite verse or story about birth in the Bible? One part of the Bible that I find fascinating is the way that the Bible talks about our whole world groaning in the pains of childbirth. And Jesus himself talks about, you know, earthquakes and famines and things being the beginning of birth pains. And so the Bible gives us a picture of actually the whole world being full of painful realities that we live through. But in fact, if these are the beginning of birth pains, these are taking us and pointing us towards something great that is to come and a new birth, not only of individuals, but of all creation in God's future plan of the biggest kind of birth, I guess, (laughs) that encompasses everything. That was Jodie McIver, and her book is called Bringing Forth Life, God's Purposes in Pregnancy and Birth. Before we finish up this episode, we didn't want to pass up an opportunity, as we're talking about birth, to wish Natasha well. She approaches the birth of her little boy. Yeah, I appreciate that. (laughs) And, you know, we sort of did this... 18 months ago or so when I was getting married, we decided to We're walking make the most you of it through and have an episode the steps and, <laughs> the milestones yes, exactly. of life. On life yep. and faith, we're doing it all. You pulled your wisdom for my benefit. So I don't know what the next milestone is for the team. Maybe, Simon, you can give advice when Justine turns 50. or <laughs> it's, it's ages away. It's ages away. 14 is the number I'm expert That's on true. at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so tell me, friends, what do I need to know? It's all about the breathing, Natasha. Oh, like okay. When um, I had Reese, it was not an ideal birthing experience. Um, and I had been looking into calm birth, one of those pre birth classes. And even though Reese's birth was not ideal, I think they told me afterwards that because of the breathing, I was able to drop my heart rate 30 beats per minute in between Ooh. contractions. So, you know, it gives you something to focus on as well as the the pain and discomfort. Reese also broke his arm like last year, right? And because he asked his dad to go with him as he was getting put under, as he was wheeled off, I thought, you know, it makes me so sad to think of him alone at some point without Vaughn with him. I really wish I could have said what I'm about to say to you, to him as well, because really like you can feel really alone even though when you're giving birth you know there's a little person inside you there's people all around you as well but it can feel really lonely but really what I wanted to say to Reese was that God always goes with you because your breath and your breathing I think always carries something of the original breath of life that God breathed into people and into each of us and so you're never really alone because you're breathing God's life. And so, you know, if that is wisdom for how you calm yourself in a traumatic time, um, and guess what? Giving birth is not the only traumatic time you will have as a parent. <laughs> so, yeah, it's all about the breathing. 
Yeah, that's beautiful to think of as well with as you await your baby's first breath. Absolutely. I think that is good advice. I'd say the breathing is important and keep breathing. My kids are 19 and 21. I'm still trying to do the, <laughs> the calm breathing <laughs> every, every time they're out and it's getting late and I'm trying to get to sleep and there's sort of a there's an anxiety attached to that that never leaves you. So don't, I mean, there's something wonderful about that as well as a little bit scary, but that's what we're talking about today, right? These things are all mixed in together. But I, you know, mm. I would say, and it's things people probably say a lot, but you know, why not? This is the, the moment to talk about it. But yeah, you, know, you can never forget. I can never forget that first, that first breath, actually, and you see the absolute wonder of life. And nothing can prepare you for that. You know, I'll never forget both times. You know, I've had two kids, but both times had that experience, the miracle of it. You probably never have feel the intensity of that moment ever again or, or certainly not before. So that squawking little shriveled up weird alien looking thing that also looks to you like the most beautiful thing you've ever seen. That was kind of my experience so breathing have your heart stretched and uh that part you never recover from in in a wonderful way thanks guys i'm tearing up a bit here this has been life and faith with me simon smart justine toe and natasha moore Now, thanks to Jodie McIver for joining us. We'll put a link to her book about pregnancy and birth in the show notes. It might not be the right one for you now, but it might be just the gift you're looking for for a friend who's expecting. We'll also add some links to other episodes of Life and Faith that delve into the joys and complexities and sometimes also the heartbreak of having or not having, as the case might be, kids. As always, we'd love for you to leave us a rating or review to share this episode with people you think um, would benefit from it. Or you can always email us to let us know what you thought at podcast at publicchristianity.org. And our thanks, as always, to our producer, the fatherly Alan Douthwaite. Next week. Butler went to speak in 1879 to a group of Cambridge undergraduates, all of them male, who did want to do exactly that, go out and change the world. And she gave them only one piece of advice. Learn how to be alone. <laughs>